saving many of the places that we think of as American liberals, and in exporting the idea of protecting the areas of the world. Um, Chris, in Doug's work in South America, of course, is an example of this on an absolutely spectacular scale, with already 2.2 million acres in conservation, all through their own private funding, the vast majority through their private funding. But there are, in fact, numerous examples of international protected areas work that is being funded through private American conservationists. The key thing to remember here, for those of you who might be on the, the right libertarian end of the spectrum or the left public uh, funds should take care of everything, and that's the role of government. The key thing to remember here is that public and private conservation uh, dollars are absolutely crucial and complementary. All of the international projects that we mentioned today are in fact perhaps uh, privately funded initiatives to, to a whole or, or to a complete extent, but all have some sort of public sector component as well. So these things are crucial. Private philanthropy doesn't replace pu public conservation dollars, and public dollars can't do it all. Private philanthropy as a mechanism for sustaining wild lands and wildlife is not only effective with a great history and a promising future, but it is also, in many cases, extremely efficient. And those of us who believe in good government believe in efficiency. I'll give one example. The uh, El Refugio Wildlife Sanctuary, private nature reserve in Bolivia, is roughly 125,000 acres. But those 125,000 acres are essentially an inholding in, uh, uh, in, a, in a national park of several million acres. And the biological field station that is there along the Paragua River helps monitor and control traffic into the national park, preventing the illegal settlement from timber poaching. So those 125,000 acres, which are owned and maintained as a research station by the Weedon Foundation, that small family foundation in New York City, actually have an ecological benefit far, far beyond the cost, which was $400,000 to buy that land. And that's the public works in a two-bedroom condo at Rosland. $400,000 for a 125,000-acre nature preserve, which uh, the tropical biologist Louise Emmons from the Smithsonian here told me every time she visits, she discovers species new to science. So this is an extraordinary example of efficient use of private conservation dollars. So I'm going to show you a few examples of, um, of natural areas protected through private philanthropy. All of these are images and stories from that, from that new book, which will be out next, shameless product plug here, which will be out next month. Century since its designation, millions of visitors have entered the Redwood Cathedral that is Muir Woods National Monument. Yet few remember how Congressman William Kent donated the land, asking President Teddy Roosevelt to name it for conservationist John Muir. Rare is the early riser waiting for sunrise atop Cadillac Mountain who could identify George Dole, the man who purchased and gave much of the surrounding country to the American people, exhausting his family fortune to create. Acadia National Park. Little known, too, is Mary Wharton, a botany professor at a small Baptist college who taught the wonders of Kentucky's natural heritage while quietly creating a sanctuary for the wildflowers she loved. These individuals, and thousands more like them, billionaires and small business people, entrepreneurs and activists, 
people from all walks of life in every corner of the country, bequeathed to future generations a priceless gift, the gift of wildness, consecrated in the form of permanently protected natural areas. For 150 years, we have been saving examples of the original America the Beautiful. These special places are the most tangible symbol of our connection to the land, but how did they come to be? In many cases, through private initiative and funding, wildlands philanthropy, which has long been an effective tool for sustaining natural beauty, ecological integrity, and wildlife habitat. Behind every place saved for nature are people. Someone like Minerva Hoyt, who lobbied President Franklin Roosevelt to protect the Southern California desert, or the anonymous donor a half century later who gave millions to buy up private inholdings for addition to Joshua Tree National Park and other federal public lands. Popular national parks such as Guadalupe Mountains and Virgin Islands would not exist if not for individuals who donated private land to create them. If John D. Rockefeller Jr. had not ignored the controversy over his land purchases in Jackson Hole and persevered in his attempt to convey that land to the public, Grand Teton would have remained only half a park. The prairie at the base of the Teton Mountains would have been carved up for private estates, and this iconic landscape would have become the exclusive playground of the few, not a national treasure protected for every citizen for all time. The grizzly bears of Southeast Alaska, the pronghorn antelope of New Mexico, the red cockaded woodpeckers of South Carolina, are also the beneficiaries of conservation philanthropy, for it has helped secure their homes. Former Governor Percival Baxter of Maine assembled New England's largest wilderness area by himself, piece by piece, buying some 200,000 acres around Mount Katahdin to keep the land forever wild. Many prominent American families have engaged in wildlands philanthropy, but this great tradition reflects diverse backgrounds. Isaac Bernheim, came to America with nothing but a thirst for liberty. Soon he was a successful businessman, and in the 1920s he bought 13,000 acres of rolling woodland for a park where all would be welcome, rich and poor, of every race without distinction. It was two grad students who founded a Colorado land trust and scraped together a down payment to buy a tract of short grass prairie for a wildlife preserve. Their success is typical of the land trust movement, when groups of committed people come together to save extraordinary places. America's wildlands philanthropy tradition has also been a force for good around the globe. Christine Tompkins, who formerly ran the Patagonia Clothing Company, donated the land for Argentina's first coastal national park in Patagonia. Doug Tompkins and Peter Buckley gave a huge swath of wilderness on the Pacific Ocean to the people of Chile to become that country's newest national park. The Whedon Foundation owns a large nature preserve in Bolivia, where researchers continue to find species new to science. Valer and Josiah Austin have established a private sanctuary in northern Mexico, where they are demonstrating innovative grassland restoration techniques. Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, helped the Amazon Conservation Association protect her in Namibia, where cheetahs now run free. Gifts of wildness may be small in size, like a petite coastal island protected from encroaching development, or huge, like the nearly 700,000 acre wildlife sanctuary in Tierra del Fuego, donated by the Goldman Sachs Company, then under the leadership of Henry Paulson. Why do people invest their time and resources to save wild nature? In a word, love. Love for wild beauty, which sustains the soul. Love for wild places, a source of humility and wonder. Love for wild creatures, our fellow members in the land community. Wildlands philanthropists tend to have a deep connection to the diversity of life and a desire to create a legacy that lasts. Buying land to protect it for nature is an effective conservation tool with a rich history and promising future. 
and with a global extinction crisis accelerating, the need for wildlands philanthropy has never been greater. Land conservation may not solve every environmental problem, but there is no doubt that strictly protected natural areas are crucial for saving biodiversity, for scientific research, and for recreation and spiritual renewal. Of course, private philanthropy does not replace, but complements strong public support for conservation, including robust funding streams. From the Alaska Peninsula to the Gulf of California, from Purple Mountain's majesty to the big sky prairie, from sea to shining sea, wildlands philanthropy is an investment that grows into the future a way to pass along the gift of wildness to future generations. Its potential is limited only by the imaginations of the people who choose to leave a living legacy, who use their private wealth to support public values, who work to ensure that wilderness and wildlife will flourish forevermore.
you meet in this swimming in this milieu are really some of the great heroes of our time. And as I think we see environmental degradation speed up and uh, really expand over every corner of the globe, these people who are involved in conservation um, will be the backstop, will be the people throwing on the brakes and trying to preserve those areas, especially key areas of habitat, so that uh, there will be something that's still standing, something that remains 100 years from now, 200 years from now, which is the manner in which you need to think about this. So we got started late. I don't want to hold you up. Does anybody have any questions or comments about any of this? Um, Barb's 